Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Dinges and uh, yeah, today I would like to talk a bit about cycles rendering. Um, I tried to keep the presentation pretty brief, so we still have uh, plenty of time for questions, especially since there are several cycles developers here in this room at the moment, so um, maybe to give you an opportunity to ask questions. So if you like, you can already start thinking about something that you always wanted to ask us, so uh, <laughs> you will have the opportunity in, in a bit. Okay, so cycles. How many of you do remember this render or that scene in particular? Okay, that's <laughs> quite a few, okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, it all started in April 2011 when uh, Brecht released uh, cycles and there was the codeblender.org blog post. And when you opened the cycles branch, you had exactly that scene in front of you, the two monkeys with two materials. And you could start rendering in the viewport and it was like, oh my God, we have a new render engine. And I know exactly how I was sitting in front of the computer and like, oh my God, this is real. And uh, yeah, um, it all started with two monkeys on a plane and um, who would have thought that this continues in such a way that we have so many amazing films today. I mean, uh, I will talk about that in a bit. Um, and yeah. I think it's pretty fair to have another slide which says thank you, Brecht, because, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk a bit about the past year since last year's Blender conference. Um, Development-wise, we had uh, four releases, I think, um, starting with 2.73, which was in January, I think. Um, um, yeah, so we had improved area light sampling, uh, which you can see pretty well here. So especially inside of volumetrics, there is uh, um, much less noise in there. And uh, also when you have an area light which is close to a surface, you have uh, better quality and uh, less noise there. Uh, as Sergey already said in his previous talk, we have camera support uh, inside of volumetric objects. That means that you can fly through clouds or whatever you want, and that works pretty well. And uh, recently in 2.75, I think, we also did an uh, optimization there, so it's a lot faster now. It was a bit slow previously, but now Sergey and I optimized it, and uh, it's up to 10% uh, faster now when you are inside a volume. Um, uh, I added light max bounces um, to light objects and um, a month ago or so also to the world. Um, as you can see in this picture, I hope it, uh, you can see it, you can now limit uh, the amount of bounces that are, yeah, and, and, uh, the amount of bounces that a light is influencing the scene. So um, we have zero bounces up there and then one bounce, two bounce, three bounce and so on. So this can help the render time if you just want to use a, a light to, yeah, as kind of fill light, for example, that just uh, illuminates the surface once and does not contribute to the global illumination. And that can help with render time a bit as well. Vendor 2.74, um, yeah, Sergey also mentioned this already. We have the QBVH uh, data structure, which helps performance a bit, and also the watertight intersection, which helps when you have a ray that is uh, intersecting two triangles exactly uh, on the edge. So you could have like light leaks or stuff like that, um, and that is fixed now. We have uh, pointiness, which is an attribute in the uh, in a node. Uh, you can use it to for effects such as dirt, dirt effects on edges or whatever if you want to give your object an, an, a bit of an old look or so stuff like that. And uh, in 2.74 we also started really with those memory optimizations which basically were a topic for the last year um, because we wanted to render Gooseberry and we already knew that it would be a major challenge to have all these sheep and the grass field and everything so we started with it end of last year and uh, basically continued with those optimizations uh, until today. In Blender 2.75, we got the uh, initial support for AMD GPUs. Um, AMD was uh, helping us and developed a patch, the uh, so-called kernel split patch, which um, basically enabled cycles to use GPU rendering on AMD cards. It's still not feature complete, so there are still a few things that are not um, and that are not supported in the OpenCL kernel, such as volumetrics, for example, or subsurface scattering. 
but we hope to um, yeah to finish that uh, at some point. And uh, Lukas Stockner was uh, having his big uh, his first big feature in Master the light portals. So when you have an interior scene and you have light coming through the window, for example, and like an HDRI outside or whatever, uh, then the light portal will help there. So you will have significantly less noise in the scene at a cost of a slightly slower render time, but uh, in the end you still have a much better image in the same amount of time that you would need to, um, yeah, if you would render without light portals. And again, performance and memory optimizations were also a topic in this release. Then in 2.76 we got point density texture, uh, which was used for a tornado on uh, Cosmos Laundromat. You can see here uh, uh, one of the first test renders from Gottfried Hofmann, who was using that to showcase the feature. And we also have camera zoom motion blur, so when you change the uh, focal length of the camera, you can now have uh, camera zoom as well, in addition to the, uh, to the motion blur that we, have, uh, that we already have before. Yeah, and also the speed ups for spatial VVH building. Um, as Sergey also said, we hopefully can make this the default at some point. Um, we can still make it multi-threaded, so it's still using one CPU core. So uh, once we make this multi-threaded, then hopefully we can at least enable it per default, uh, or maybe even remove the option and just always do the spatial BVH build. Uh, we'll see. We we're gonna see how this works out. And there were further enhancements for AMD GPUs. So when you have uh, when you're on o o uh, OS X and you update it to the latest uh, El Capitan release, then you can now render on Mac OS with AMD GPUs as well. Okay, let's talk a bit about artwork. So um, I'm really, really happy about everything that you guys do with Cycles. It's, uh, there's no better way to thank us, I think, than by doing amazing artwork. I mean, that's, that's just what, what keeps us uh, doing what we do, because uh, every time we see a new short film, an animation, an image, it's just like, wow, you guys did that, and then we of course want to make it even better for you and everything, so please keep that up and keep doing amazing artwork. And um, one thing that is really noticeable compared to the first one or two years is that uh, there are more and more animations. So in the beginning, I guess, of course, due to render time, I assume, there were more still images and by now there are more and more animations coming up and that's really amazing and also the complexity of course is getting uh, yeah is growing so just uh, three images quickly and to showcase uh, three things that uh, i like a lot cosmos laundromat of course with its complexity and the grass and the volumetrics and uh, it's just amazing so uh, yeah big round of applause for the team uh, they have done an amazing job. And uh, yeah, Cosmos Laundromat recently, uh, just last week, uh, won the Animago Award uh, for great quality and everything. So yeah, I think that speaks for itself. And uh, there was another Animago Award uh, going to... Uh, this image uh, from uh, he's called Frequenzlos uh, on the forums, and he's done this artwork also with cycles, and I think that's a really nice one as well. And everyone who was yesterday at the screening, of course, the Alike short film by Daniel Martinez Lara, it's just another great example of how people are using cycles these days. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't see really noise in there, so I think <laughs> it's it's quite well done and. Uh, yeah, but before I talk too much about those kind of things, let me just quickly show you the demo reel which uh, Alexander Mitzkus edited for this year's FMX conference. And uh, it should give you, I mean, I guess most of you already know this, but let's just play this back. And can we maybe dim the lights a bit, please? And maybe we can see it a bit better. Thank you.
Yeah, so I really like all the artwork that is in there and uh, I cannot wait for next year's FMX to just find the opportunity to do another demo reel. It's, it's just amazing. Okay, so let's talk about some upcoming plans and changes. Um, so here's a list that Sergey and I did yesterday. So uh, you probably have seen the shadow catcher already. Uh, Sergey was showing it at the end of his presentation. And there will also be a self-shadow option probably. So you can uh, probably in the ray visibility panel, so you can avoid self-shadowing if you want to have that disabled for certain objects. There is uh, some work going on on denoising functionality, like post-processing, denoising, which will probably be part of the compositing workflow. That's not really certain. That is Sergey here. Yeah, we'll see how exactly we... Of course. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see how exactly we will implement that. And um, we will also look again at the adaptive sampling patch from Lucas and see how we can use that and uh, yeah, if this can be integrated. Then the OpenCL split needs more work. As I already said, volumes are missing, subsurface scattering is missing. Um, and we probably want to do the same thing for the CUDA kernel so that um, NVIDIA users can also benefit from the performance improvements. The thing is here that uh, the CUDA kernels are static at the moment. So we built one CUDA kernel, which contains all the features. And we want to do the same thing like what we have for OpenCL now. So it is scene, in, uh, it is, it is scene dependent. So when you have a scene open that does not contain any grass, for example, then the kernel will be compiled without hair rendering code. So that is a speed up, especially on the GPU, which then can avoid all kinds of calculations. And the kernel itself is smaller, which also results in a lower memory footprint than for the kernel software itself. So we hope to implement that for CUDA as well and make feature-aware uh, compilation uh, so that if your scene is pretty simple, then the kernel will be faster. And only if the scene contains all the crazy stuff like hair, volumes, etc., etc., then we will compile the big kernel. Um, yeah, further optimizations, uh, hair, intersections, um, motion blur, I guess uh, volumetrics as well. I think those are the areas where we can still squeeze out performance, hopefully. And um, we will maybe also look a bit into virtual reality stuff. Um, it was mentioned yesterday already that um, the third episode of Caminandes, and a short part of it will probably be uh, rendered in VR, so maybe we will add some stuff there to make this possible. And also one thing that I'm really, really happy about is that Cycles is also now getting used outside of Blender. Uh, this trend started a few years ago when we relicensed Cycles from GPL to Apache, which allows for commercial use in, in, in software packages as well. And there are two projects who are at the moment implementing Cycles, and one of them is Rhino 3D. Um, Nathan Ledvory is implementing that for Rhino and it should be a part of the next upcoming Rhino uh, version. Um, I'm not sure when exactly that release will be, but uh, it should be there. And uh, he made a lot of great progress there and uh, he uploads YouTube videos regularly. Uh, let me just, I mean, I just have a bit of time show you that. Um, He regularly posts um, videos about this. <laughs> um, yeah, let's take this one for example. So um, yeah, it's really nice to see cycles outside of uh, Blender as well. And uh, yeah, this is Rhino 3D now. And he made a lot of, uh, so it's GPU rendering only as far as I know. So he's only utilizing that. It's not possible to render on a CPU, I think. And uh, yeah. So that's cycles just outside of Blender. <laughs> And uh, we recently got to know that uh, Poser is also integrating it. I think they renamed it to Superfly or something like that. 
information, but uh, yeah, I don't have um, much information about that yet. So I'm not sure if there's a public build available yet, um, but they are definitely working on that. And they also contributed a small patch back to us, which fixed some issues with area lights in combination with multiple important sampling. So it's also nice to see some contributions then from people who work on that outside of Blender. Okay, and that's basically it for my presentation part. I really want to thank again everyone who uh, works on Cycles, who tests it, who makes great artwork with it. And uh, I'm standing here in front of you at the moment, but there are so many people contributing. Um, so we have Brecht here in the room who worked on it uh, a lot, who started the project in the first place. We have Lukas Stockner here who worked on portals, for example, and adaptive sampling. And we have Sergei here and uh, Lukas Tönnies maybe here as well, who worked on OSL. And we have Dalai Felinto working on baking and uh, fisheye cameras and everything. And Stuart Broadfoot, who did the hair rendering. And there's so many people. And just thanks to everyone making this project possible. It's amazing. OK, so we still have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. So, yeah. Who first? Yes, there is a first one. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. One, two, one. Hello. Uh, we spoke a bit earlier on. Just, mm -hmm. I just wanted to do with whether there was any attention doing in general while everyone's listening i guess for things like uh, procedural textures mm -hmm. like is anyone going back to that and taking a look at say the voronoi mm -hmm. uh, procedural noise for example like changing the size of the cracks mm -hmm. or maybe having a like a bevel distance and mm -hmm. that kind of thing because at the moment you've got like the, the you can do the color cells or mm -hmm. the you've got like the more sort of bubbly looking version mm -hmm. You know, but the cells don't have any kind of crack distance, if you see what I mean. And and for obviously for a lot of procedural texturing, cracks and stuff in surfaces shows up quite a lot. So it's, is it? I mean, is there anyone looking at that quite frequently? So um, we haven't really looked into procedural textures uh, much lately. Um, and the thing is. Um, that basically uh, every time you add a new node and especially procedural textures, it increases the size of the mega kernel that we have, which is a problem on the GPU. So we were a bit yeah, hesitant in the past to add new uh, textures there. But um, I think it's a good um, uh, opportunity now when we do the kernel split and also for 2.8 um, to rethink the procedural textures that we bundle with Blender. Um, of course, there's always OSL, which you can use on the CPU if you want to go crazy with textures and whatnot. But uh, for the GPU, we might rethink some things, um, add a new texture, maybe change some things, but that's yet to be seen. Um, there is a, a patch, I think, in the tracker about Voronoi or something, which extends it a bit. Um, but uh, we have to see how much we change. But uh, yeah, we're definitely cool. open for feedback there. But as I said, in the past, it was a problem for the GPU. But that's hopefully not a problem anymore in the future. So we'll see. Great, thanks. Sure. Will um, Cycles Baking be improved in the future? Uh, I am, I'm not sure about Cycles Baking exactly. Um, the life I worked on it, and there are some fixes from time to time, but. Uh, at least, yeah, it's, it's an area which at least I personally don't really see as a, as a priority for me, but I can just, yeah, speak for myself here. Uh, when there is a, a crucial bug in there, of course, we try to fix that in, in every area of cycles, but when it comes to new additions and features, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it depends on people. And if, if there's interest in, if someone is interested uh, in working on that, then we, we welcome everyone, but uh, yeah, I Thank cannot you. promise anything there. Thank you. I second the question about the cycles baking and also uh, pointiness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually point, uh, any plan for pointiness that is not so dependent on topology. So mm -hmm. basically the same thing as saying mm -hmm. uh, cavity baking mm -hmm. or, 
or pointiness or mm -hmm. pointiness node that is not dependent on uh, mm -hmm. topology. Okay, I would relay the question to Sergey because he implemented pointiness. So <laughs> maybe he knows. Well, I mean pointiness. <coughs> Pointiness depends on topology because the topology depend, which defines how pointy the, the surface is. The only issue that we're using vertex color to store the, the actual pointiness in the, in, the, in the kernel. So what we can do is to generate some 2D texture in there and do some procedural mapping on it in order to, to, to improve the like resolution of, of the pointiness map. Improvement is always possible, and we also could improve like the, the algorithm of pointiness calculation as well. But that was just the first uh, step of, of getting the feature done, which was also required by Gooseberry actually. But <coughs> yeah, we, we, we will keep working on this. But there are various stuff to, 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 to be supported there. But it's not always so much trivial to do, and just give us some time. Follow up later, but yeah, no, you're right. Of course, it's uh, it's better. Uh, cavity is something that's generally converted from uh, from the normal map. But uh, uh, for example, I think it's only um, V-ray as a something that is cavity that is um, pointiness, but not dependent on uh, its distance uh, uh, base, and it, it does the same thing, but um, on the fly while rendering. And uh, and actually, it was uh, if I have one second. I can, yeah, it's it's true that uh, that wouldn't be something to, uh, for, for example, cavity baking wouldn't be something to implement as a, uh, as an option, but would probably be better something more generic, like the ability of adding some uh, image nodes, compositing nodes to what you bake in uh, in Blender to do stuff more more generic, like from normal having the cavity and uh, for exporting to engines and for exporting in general, being even just some channel mixing would be probably the, so yeah, I, I, you're right about saying that the uh, pointiness is, uh, cavity is better to be converted, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you plan to implement uh, Disney materials and uh, also uh, e-expression? Sorry, I couldn't understand the question. What do, what you, do you plan to implement uh, Disney materials? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there are concrete plans for this at the moment, uh, but we, uh, we certainly want to look into additional BSDFs and shaders. So, um, yeah, the, business, the Disney BSDF is a good model to look into. Uh, we always wanted to have some sort of Uber shader to implement, to have like a one note with uh, some sliders to tweak certain effects. So. Yeah, it's certainly something we can look into, yeah. And also e-expression, the yes, uh, expression uh, texture language from Disney. Yeah, not sure about that one yet, no. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, by, the, by the way, just out of curios uh, curiosity, how many of you in this room are using CPU for rendering? Okay, and how many use GPUs then? Okay, that's roughly the same, I guess. That's interesting. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hi. I was wondering, uh, once uh, OpenCL is up to scratch on parity with uh, CUDA, <clears throat> does it make sense to you to carry on developing both, considering um, <clears throat> CUDA cards can also render using OpenCL2? Do you think it just makes sense to concentrate on one GPU compute platform, or is it not much work to update both? Um, of course, I guess uh, it would be ideal to just keep OpenCL and kick CUDA out, but in, in practice that's not going to happen, I guess, because um, CUDA code still runs faster than OpenCL code, and uh, it could be that there are some optimizations that we haven't done yet, uh, in particularly because we have CUDA and haven't worried about OpenCL running on NVIDIA platform. But um, just off the record, I would assume that maybe um, NVIDIA, I mean, uh, OpenCL runs on top of CUDA. So I guess it, native CUDA code will always be a bit faster, whether it's intentional or design or whatever. So I don't think that we will be able to just 
go with, with one backend and uh, kick out the other. So I think that's unlikely. Okay. Sergey, you have an addition there? <laughs> well, we're actually going to, to bump OpenCL2 requirement mm -hmm. relatively soon, and uh, NVIDIA is not going to do this anytime soon, yeah. and we, can, we, we, we cannot wait for them to, to, mm -hmm. to do this. So it kind of makes sense to, to support CUDA as well. Yeah. It's, it, it's the same code base anyway, so it's, it's not like it's giving a huge amount of overhead right. for us anyway. But we, we, we just cannot stick to, to OpenCL just because it's open mm -hmm. and uh, stick to all the specifications and suffer from yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Are, you, are you planning to make Cycus become the default renderer? <laughs> We had this topic yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last year, and um, I think the, the main issue that is preventing us from switching is that uh, for import-export scripts, it's uh, uh, import and export scripts are not really working well with cycles yet. So when you have like a material that you want to export with FBX or Collada or whatnot, the code is there to do it uh, based on Blender internal, but not for cycles yet. So I think that was one of the main arguments um, apart from that, I mean, it is, it is a user preference anyway, so you can save your startup blend file with whatever render engine you prefer. So it's not like it's a pressing issue. I mean, sure, it would be cool, but um, yeah, if there are still some things that need to be worked on, then I would just keep it as is at the moment. Yeah. And I mean, when we have, then, when we have the viewport project and uh, a new OpenGL style render engine there in combination with it, then maybe that will be the default as well. And uh, so we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, I think it's time for one last question. Uh, I noticed that when when I render with with my GPU, uh, the CPU uh, mostly stand idles. So, is, is it possible that 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 cycles can use bo use both CPU and GPU? And that's something that we can certainly look into. Um, it's al already possible with OpenCL, but that's not going to run as fast as a native CPU code, native CUDA combination. So that's something that can be improved and, uh, yeah, certainly something that we can work on at some point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again and enjoy cycles. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.